chairs myself. You're welcome. <laughs> Cheers! <laughs> Hi there. Welcome to Bourbon Turntable. We're off to a rousing start. Uh, if this were a, uh, you know, if we were at a, a boxing match, they would have come out swinging. Let's go. Early. Yeah. Let's go. Right. Uh, but anyway, uh, welcome to Bourbon Turntable. We are the show that blends the love of music with the love of whiskey. With me tonight is Beth Burrows, the Senior American Whiskey Ambassador for Jim Beam. Did I get the title right? Yes, we uh, it's that's the kind of like condensed versus the James B. Beam Distilling Company, which well, just yes. makes it that much longer. But okay, yes, I, essentially, I, 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 I will show you later that I did know that it's the James B. Beam <laughs> Distilling Company. But uh, for 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 the unlearned uh, amongst us, what, what, Jim Beam, yes, Jim yes, Beam. Jim Beam, yes, just Jim <laughs> Beam. Uh, but we're going to be talking with Beth uh, about herself, uh, her career. Uh, we'll talk with her about what's going on with Jim Beam, and we'll talk with her about music and dig into what she really likes to listen to and what she's she's seen in uh, concerts, what albums she's bought, all that great stuff as we typically do. And we're doing a blind flight of Beam products with her, and she's she was very brave, and uh, <laughs> she she trusts me that this isn't some uh, gotcha thing. Uh, it's not, it, 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 there's a method to my madness and hopefully it will, uh, be clear, uh, at the end. But before we, uh, get into our conversation with Beth, we want to tell you a little bit about Firecart Co-op. Firecart Co-op is a collection of friends who produce content for the whiskey enthusiasts. We have distillers talk with Alan Bishop and Christy Atkinson. Alan and Christy talk with distillers from across the country and around the world about anything and everything in terms of distillation and how what is in that bottle that you have and your hands, how it got there. Alan also does a couple other shows. One is called One Piece at a Time Distilling Institute, where he'll take questions from you and then he'll post video responses to those questions. It can be anything and everything related to distilling. Alan also does a show called If You Have Ghosts, You Have Everything, where he delves into the uh, supernatural, paranormal, and spiritual realm of uh, the spirits world and spiritual things. My Whiskey Den with Pat and Mike and Mitch airs every Monday night, 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central. My Whiskey Den is where craft whiskey is king. Every Monday night, they do some great tastings. They have some wonderful guests, and it's fun to hang out with the good folks in the chat. The newest member of the Barcart Co-op is David Levine with Whiskey in My Wedding Ring. David is a very clever, very smart writer. He has a wonderful blog where he does reviews. He has a podcast where he'll interview distillers and he'll do video uh, reviews on that as well. So be sure to check out everything that he's doing. And then as for our show, you can watch us on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube right now, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. We would definitely appreciate that. If you just want to listen to us, you can do so on your favorite podcast platform, as long as it's Apple, Spotify, or Google. We have a Facebook page where we release all of our shows. We have a Facebook group where I'll post and you can post. What are you drinking that night? And what are you listening to while you're drinking it? Maybe it's something we haven't had before. Maybe it's something we haven't listened to in a long time and it brings up some great memories and we'll just all join right in with you. So that's our show. That's what we do. And what we do right now is we get to talk with somebody that's absolutely fabulous. Beth Burroughs, welcome to Bourbon Turntable. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I've wanted to have you on for a long time. And, and I saw you uh, at, at an event at Westport Whiskey and Wine. You've done several events that I've attended there. And uh, it was a fascinating event where you're basically breaking down the components of a Little Book 7, I believe it was, right? Yes. And that was a lot of fun. And so after that, I just came up and started talking to you and, uh, you know, got to, got you to uh, agree that you'd come <laughs> on. And then I've just pestered you ever since. So not uh, pestering at all. I'm glad that you're here. And so I, I did mention that we're going to do uh, a flight, a uh, blind flight of Jim Beam products. And there are three of those. So we'll go ahead and get your sample A poured and ready to sip. Gotcha. All right. And so while we're doing, uh, while we're enjoying this and, uh, spoiler alert, actually it's not a spoiler alert cause you don't know, but this is one of my favorite Jim Beam products of all time. Okay. Yeah. 
So we'll we'll leave it at that. So <laughs> as as we're sipping on this, tell us a little bit about uh, your background. Uh, where are you from? Let's start there. That's always a good start. <laughs> good place to start. Definitely. So um, I was born and raised in Western New York. Um, I have now lived in Kentucky longer than I, I lived in Western New York, but most of my family is still there. Um, so I, I still definitely, you know, feel that that my roots and everything um, happened in South of Buffalo. Um, yeah. practically Pennsylvania and practically Canadian. I don't, <laughs> the easiest way to say it, because most of the time people are like, where? Because that's why I have to say New York State, right? It's not New York City. I'm right. far from New York City from where I grew up. Um, but yeah, so we were we were closer to Niagara Falls and really close to like Erie, Pennsylvania. So um, but beautiful, yeah, beautiful part of the country there. Yes, I don't uh, miss it during these months as much. Nope. <laughs> uh, however, summertime, fall, fall especially, I definitely miss it during the fall and, and yeah. seeing the leaves change with the rolling hills. It's, it's super beautiful. But um, yeah, so I, I kind of was born and, and grew up there and I moved to Kentucky when I was approaching high school age. Mm -hmm. um, I moved to Breckenridge County, Kentucky. Shout out Breckenridge. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we... We were in Breckenridge County, Kentucky for my high school years, and then I moved to Louisville after that to go to school at the University of Louisville. So yeah. that's kind of been my journey along the way. And and at uh, University of Louisville, Louisville, did you do, did you study um, uh, American whiskey ambassadorship? <laughs> that didn't exist. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. So weird. <laughs> Um, honestly, m most of the things that are now available, like through the University of Kentucky and yeah. uh, the James B. Beam Distilling Company Institution and, and things like that, those weren't available during that period of time. And honestly, I don't know if I would have started there. Yeah. I was obsessed and still am obsessed with athletics. Um, so I went to school for sports administration. I oh. wanted to be a reporter on the NFL football field. <laughs> there you go. Well, I mean, I can see that there's some how the skill set can carry over <laughs> it's talking in front of people yes. you know getting into something and understanding the yes. nitty-gritty of it all yeah and 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 uh, a woman playing in a male dominated world mm -hmm. so you've got to have some um some gumption there to to be willing to step out in that um so were you a whiskey drinker early on i mean when you're we won't talk about you know before you were 21 we'll assume that i that only drink never um uh, no i <laughs> i would say it kind of became an appreciation mm -hmm. in the the 20 aughts um like leading up so like just about post-college i will say um you know during the college years there definitely was some interesting choices of american whiskey um for folks to be sipping on but it was a journey to get into it. It didn't really fully solidify until about 2013, if I'm being 100% honest, as something yeah. that I was super into and, and super, um, you know, that was what was in my glass all yeah. of the time. Um, was never really a, a beer girl. Um, just never, never fancied it. I could always taste one and just be like, yes, I think that this is a good beer, but it was never something that I, I imbibed on for long periods of time. Right. Um, I kind of started in wine. Um, don't ask mm -hmm. me questions about it. I just know, yes, I liked it. No, I didn't. That was about um, the extent <laughs> of my, <laughs> my knowledge. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I, I'd say that it was kind of more dabbling in, in the cocktail realm. And that cocktail realm got me into American whiskey. And then that moved me into not only an appreciation for the spirit, obviously, in cocktails, but mm -hmm. for neat rocks, the history of it, the chemistry of it, right? That just kind of all, all kick-started around that yeah. period of time. Yeah. When you say you, you got into the cocktail realm of it, just as someone that enjoyed a lot of different cocktails, or were you doing bartending or how, how did that all play in? So I actually started, I mean, if we want to go way, way back in the service industry, um, my parents owned a bar and restaurant in Western New York. Um, it was called Guitars and Cadillacs. It was named after the Dwight Yoakam song. Um, <laughs> Love it. And it was, um, it was my parents' vision to just kind of have this establishment that served, you know, bar snacks, had a full on kitchen um, and, and had a, a full stocked bar. And they would bring in musical acts that would play throughout the summer. And so I bust tables and sorted recycling and, mm -hmm. and did things of that nature. And so hospitality has been inside of me forever. Like, honestly, it's just been something that I always find myself coming back to. Um, and I felt like that was a key 
thing so we can talk about you know musicians later yeah. um <laughs> but with that yeah. Um, you know, it was really be getting behind the stick, becoming a bartender in mm-hmm. my early twenties. And I was a, I was a turn and burn bartender for quite some time. And we were, you know, making as many, um, drop in shots if you will, with, <laughs> with things. And, and, um, it just kind of, that was where it started. I, I loved creating. I loved tasting the different, different liqueurs and, and, and different base liquors that we were putting into things. And then that moved into craft bartending again in like the early 20 aughts. Okay. Um, is that bar still there in Western New York? No, no. Oh. So when we moved, I know, uh, Guitars and Cadillacs did shut down um, when my parents and I, so I, I come from a very large family. It's a yours, mine and ours family. I say parents and I have two sets of parents, my mom, my stepfather and my dad, and my stepmother. That being said, they are all mom and dad to me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Um, my dad and my stepmother have, have stayed in Western New York. And then my mom and my stepfather moved to Kentucky with me, um, you know, in the, the early 2000s. And then have just kind of stayed stayed close the whole time so yeah. they're they're outside of e-town now um but yeah so that bar that bar no longer <laughs> well I, I, I was i was about to plan a road trip <laughs> yeah right because <laughs> it, it, it humphrey it, new york let me it, tell you <laughs> what look there there are great bars and great music amazing yes. everywhere you mm-hmm. just you just have to be keep your eyes open and and look for it yes um, but one thing, uh, and and your your uh, an, an example of that, and what you're wearing tonight, you have a strong hat game. I do, yes. Yeah, just, I mean, <laughs> here, here's just a small oh, sampling. Oh, you pulled, you pulled references. <laughs> Love yes, it. I mean this is three, and what you're wearing is four. Uh, if you had to guess, how many different hats do you own? Um, so I am actually calling my collection right now um, to just <laughs> my custom pieces. So I still have a, a multitude of hats. I will be going through and and just deciding, you know, which ones are going to stay and which ones are, are going to find new homes. Um, <laughs> so I I would say I probably I max out at probably about thirty five, okay. um, which is an insane amount of hats. And there's nowhere for me to keep all of them. So. I have been moving again into to more of like the actually curated collection of mm-hmm. custom hats that are made specifically for my head size um, and and for my liking of, of what I'm hoping to have on, on the hats. Yeah, you um, you post a lot of that <clears throat> on your Instagram page and you, you even where, hey, I've got a new hat, <laughs> you, you, uh, you know, give uh, props to the to the. the hat maker oh yeah it's it's a it's a a milner yeah it's a it's a whole process and there's so much love and dedication and knowledge that goes into being a milner um this one is from wild hats and uh her name is chloe i've named them Mm -hmm. i don't know why it just became a thing that i started doing but um we actually had i'm trying to look at the side here this is a um dried floral arrangement by bloom droots as well so it was a collaboration hat between a couple small companies very cool very cool. See, you you can pull off a hat like that. See, I I I I can get ball cap, and that's basically it. Uh, I just look ridiculous. You otherwise. don't. I tell people all the time, they're like, "How do you wear a hat?" I'm like, "You just put it on your head." Literally, yeah. like I just did it. Uh, it. I didn't even do it. Honestly, I have to give I have to give props to a fellow named Adam Harris, um, mm-hmm. who's a very close friend of mine who I work with still to this day. He put on an LBJ Stetson on my head in texas during yeah. an event and that he was like this suits you i think that this is great and it started a hat obsession yeah. that can't be stopped yeah it, much uh, i'll say this much better than an ascot much much better <laughs> yeah. I'm, than an no, ascot. I'm not gonna say anything <laughs> okay. that man can also pull off a hat so <laughs> he's been known to, to throw one on as well <clears throat> um uh, talk. I want to talk with you a little bit about your social media as well, because I think that appears to be a, a big part of what you do beyond just, hey, here's a picture of a, the latest iteration of a Basil Hayden or a little book or whatever the case may be. Um, one of the things that, that you talk about in, in your social media is self-image. Mm-hmm. And you're very open about that. And I think that is... Uh, fantastic that you are because I think that's something that 
anybody that's not a sociopath, <laughs> yes. they struggle with to some degree. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So, um, well, I appreciate I appreciate that sentiment so much. Um, it, it's been something that I've always had a problem we were talking about prior to starting the recording. I'm very much an open book. Um, I spend mm -hmm. a lot of my time. I don't know how <clears> to, to really not just be myself and, and be myself in spaces. And that comes mm -hmm. with a little bit of brain chaos here and there. And, and a lot of times, you know, that brain chaos does, does revolve around image and mm -hmm. being someone who is put on screen or having photographs taken of me or things like that, not in like a crazy way, I don't want it to sound like, oh my gosh, paparazzi. It's not like that. Right. Um, but, you know, being in spaces where your image is captured quite a bit and it might be you're on a stage and everyone else is lower than than you are or um, you're talking a lot like I do. Um, there's a lot of unflattering angles and a lot of um, interesting captures of, of you in a moment. And mm -hmm. I think that it's humbling um, so much so that I do have friends who are also in the business who you know, almost just promote those images as here it is. It's very funny, right? Those, those are things that happen, mm -hmm. but you have to get to a certain point of comfortability before you can laugh at those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so as somebody who is in eating disorder recovery and, and has been for a multitude of years and it's, you know, image has been something that I've dealt with the entirety of my life. Uh, it just, it feels less alone if I say it out loud. And I think mm -hmm. that if it, it helps other people feel less alone in that space, then, um, it's, it's good, right? It's good to talk about it. It's it's not good to push it down and pretend like it doesn't exist sure. when it does. Sure. I mean, if if I spoke to other people the way that I speak to myself in my head, I would be uh, ascribed to being the worst a-hole on the planet. <laughs> right? You know? We're so mean to ourselves. Yes. We're so, and I don't know where that comes from. I don't know like what type of, you know, voice is just kind of implanted in us. And <clears> I'm, I'm always so envious and proud of people who have the ability to either not have that voice or to quiet that voice or, you know, to, to move through that. Cause it's, it's yeah. such an enviable quality, but we all have brain chaos. Sure. But, but I think that we, we can, like you say, quiet that voice or have the, um, the proper voice become louder than that critical voice. But it, it, it takes discipline, it takes practice, it takes faith, you know, whatever it is that you, you need to go through and, and, and to work through to get there. But there is a path to get there. And I think the things that you're willing to post and be open about help people see that, you know, not everybody else doesn't have it together. You're not the only one that is dealing with stuff. <laughs> Because sure. that, that's that's the number one lie that we're number told. Lie, yeah. It's just me. I'm the only one. Never. You know? yeah. And it's just never. never the case. It's never the case. But never. Uh, yeah. I mean, listen, I I have great days and I have not so great mm -hmm. days and I have things in between. Um, you know, it's it's definitely something that I'm working through and actively working through. And and again, there's there's good days, there's bad days, there's in between days. Um, I'm trying to get to a point of like neutrality, if I'm being honest. It used to be like this, uh, this message of just like, love everything and love yourself and love all, yes, obviously try to do that. But even getting to a point of just <clears throat> neutral, being right. neutral about the skin that you're in, being neutral about not letting it ruin days, not letting it um, right. affect you and your mood and, and the way that you see the world. Um, I think that that's, that's something yeah. that I'm working on right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think we've got to be willing to, we've got to be our best cheerleader. I mean, I think at some point you you do need to be um, your critic because you, again, unless you're a sociopath, we want to get better. Right, we, right, right. We want, we, we want to be better. Um, but that can be done in a healthy way. Definitely. And, and not relying on what does everybody else say about me as being the barometer of, you know, am I am I good enough? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, uh, there's a pretty famous, um, skit that's done by a comedian and I, I won't go like super deep into it, but like, there's a, there's a few curse words, <laughs> but essentially it's just like, it's called self-esteem because it's the esteem of yourself, right? Like right. it is, it is definitely <clears throat> something that you have to build up and you're with yourself 24 hours a day, seven days right. a week. You are the right. one that's inside of your head saying those things. And, and it is, um, it is truly, 
punishing if you continue to just say negative things and you look at the world and you look at yourself negatively and right. you know, that that self-talk is is incredibly important and how you choose to to do that self-talk is incredibly important yeah yeah and social media can be oh my gosh very know. bad for all of that it, yeah. it could either be someone is you know uh codependent and they'll post something oh look at me i look so i'm so ugly or i'm so fat or i'm so whatever and then they're just you know baiting the hook for people to come in and say oh no you're fabulous and and, and that's not good but then there's the other side of it where you have these people that have keyboard courage and anything that you post out there there there's somebody that's wanting to tear you down and, and there's always there's always going to be people on both sides i mean yep. i will say it, it I think that that is a, an ask for a need to be fulfilled, right? If somebody is right. putting something out there and, and they do have maybe some sort of caption that says something that is, um, <clears throat> you know, a little bit more of like, this is how I'm feeling. Sometimes people don't have the vocabulary in that moment to, to say, right. hey, this is what I need. This is how I'm feeling. You know, I think that one of the bigger things is having a network of people around you that will tell you the truth and tell you when yep. you're being too hard on yourself and, and build you up when they need to and also keep you honest when they need to. Um, having that network of people is really important. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. times, especially in a post-COVID world, that network has deteriorated for a lot of people. And right. so social media is a, a replacement in that space. And right. we just people just need to be kind, like be kind to yourself, be kind to other people. Like there's no reason right. for us to be going on the internet and, and spewing hate towards people or, you know, looking in a mirror and spewing hate towards yourself. It's not helpful. Right. And to, to segue this back towards whiskey a little <laughs> bit and, and, and thank you for, uh, you know, allowing that. Uh, Listen, I can talk about that for hours. Yeah. Um, but to, to bring it back towards whiskey, it even happens with that. And, oh, you know, yeah. somebody will post a bottle. Look, I just got one of these. And then it's, that sucks. How do you like that? You're mm -hmm. you're an idiot. Why did you pay for that? And okay, you can't just say, good for you. Cool. Okay. Great. <laughs> Enjoy your bottle. Like, why? Thumbs why up. Can't whatever. That? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know why we can't just say that. But that that's kind of where we are. But let's, you know. You, me, and you—we're gonna make it better. Uh, we're gonna—we're gonna be the ones that start to make it better. Um, so we've uh, gone through sample. You've had the chance to sip on sample yep, a little bit. I have. It's so, probably my palate. I didn't sip anything today, just to keep myself. Okay. Wow. Look at. So you're 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 exercising the the discipline <laughs> that um, who's the taster for a centauri in 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 Japan? Fukuyasan. Yes. Yeah. Shinjuku. Yeah. He doesn't eat anything with really any taste i don't think and, he is very specific i mean he will yeah. if he's not in the tasting space but he is yeah. very specific on his diet he knows what affects his palate and he refuses to to introduce anything into his diet that is going to affect his palate in a way that he can't remedy yeah well anyway <laughs> good for you for having that discipline but let's let's <laughs> pour some of a uh, sample b and uh while we're uh tasting that uh i want to make sure that you have a chance to tell everybody where they can find you and what you do there's your profile <laughs> picture from uh instagram that is me yeah so um i am pretty active on instagram you can find me at the handle bourbon bella um it's a it's a really long standing i think i've had it since 2013 so you can go back and just kind of see my whiskey journey if you're really <laughs> um it's been an interesting one but yeah, please feel free. I always tell people, you know, especially if, if I'm doing educations and things, reach out if if you're in the trade and you have somebody asking you a question in mm -hmm. later hours, right, where you can't necessarily just drop a text or you're not in a space to drop an email. Just just ask me, you know, if, if there's something that I can help with or if, if you want to have some sort of discourse. Yeah, um, yeah it's, a, it's a great place to, to connect for you to tag me and see what you're doing with mm -hmm. our amazing brands. And for if you're interested to see what I'm doing across the U.S. with with the brands as well. Yeah uh but uh, in all sincerity I, you're a, you're a fantastic follow on instagram it's Thank a lot you. of fun both with the whiskey stuff which is which is great but also just your your personal journey and that's that's wonderful as well i'm a whole human try to make sure people <laughs> realize that <laughs> um so let's talk a little bit about jim beam how did you get hooked up with uh 
with being uh, being an employee and 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 to get to the role that you're in now? So um, it started, like I said, in kind of the 20, 20 aughts. Um, I was I was in the service industry. I'd gotten out of the service industry. I was in kind of like a turn and burn space where it was high volume. It was very late nights. It was, um, you know, I was raising my child at the time as well. And it was just a lot. Mm. Um, and so I stepped away from that space for a moment. I did some insurance for, for a while and realized that was not necessarily the realm in which I wanted to be in. I will say it was very generous of them to take me on and, and teach me the things. Um, but a piece of me was missing. And so I, I came back and started as a server in a bar and restaurant that was opening up with a new, very strong whiskey and specifically mm -hmm. bourbon concept. And I was like, I just need to get back in, foot in the door, how, whatever it takes. Like I will do whatever position you have open, I, I want to interview for. And so they had a serving position available and it was before it opened. And so we had this amazing opportunity to go as this team to different distilleries and mm -hmm. to have people come and speak to us and to taste and sample so many different brands. And just this one, the student inside of me, I think was awoken. I was no longer in college and there was just right. this piece of me that just got really excited about understanding that the historical context and understanding the chemistry behind and, and even just like what was happening inside of my palate to be able to taste. And so I worked my way through that, that job. Um, I got behind the stick after a little bit of time and then moved my way into, I was, I was a competition mixologist when I was there. Um, I'm just so weird to say. I made drinks. I really like lighting things on fire for judges. That was about, <laughs> um, the extent of, of that. But I won a few competitions and, um, you know, became friends with people across the American whiskey business mm -hmm. and moved into an AGM position and then eventually into a general manager position. And so um, had worked my way through in about three years from from server to GM. And I had made a really great friendship with with a couple of people, again, on on the, the whiskey side of the American whiskey business and someone who had a position at Beam, um, the wonderful Megan Breyer came to me and said, Hey, I'm moving to California. I'm taking a different position within the company. Um, all I know is I think that you would be great and I'm leaving. And that's what I can tell you. You do with that information what you will. And so I applied um, and after a multitude of interviews and a couple of months, I, I received the call that, essentially said that the position was mine. And so that was in 2016. Awesome. I started July 11th of 2016, which is insane. It'll be eight years in July. Um, and through that time had the the territory of Kentucky to start out with. And then as there's been some adjustments throughout the business, um, took on the East region of the U S and then more recently became the senior American whiskey, whiskey ambassador that covers nationally. And I have, um, three amazing direct reports that cover the East, the central and the West, um, across the U S and we all work together to spread the good word of, of American whiskey. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that, that's really is quite a, a progression and uh you know you've you've taken advantage of the opportunities as they they they've uh, presented right. themselves and that's that's great um uh, so you've you've been with beam then for eight years so yes <laughs> yeah uh, seven and three quarters i don't know whatever, <laughs> whatever seven, it is. seven yeah. plus um is there something that specifically drew you to Beam or was that where the opportunity was? Um, I think there was always a draw to mm -hmm. to to Beam as a whole. Um, one, because of the people that I had worked with who worked on the Beam portfolio were people who became very close to me. Beam Centauri as a whole. So I made a lot of really great friends across Beam Centauri. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was an amazing step in that type <clears throat> of direction of I love what they're doing. I love how they do it. Um, and I would definitely love to be working in the same space as these folks. I love these brands. Um, yeah. Baker's has been a brand that I have definitely um, partaken in long before I, I came into this side of the business. Same with with old granddad. I think that that one always will have a special place in my heart. Yeah. Um, but with that, it was kind of just it was this perfect storm of timing and people and right opportunity. And I had this moment when I moved to Kentucky, my parents took me 
out and about, we would go to like Louisville on the weekends, right? That was because we were in Breckenridge County. We would go and do like our grocery shopping and things on the weekend. And one of those times they were like, we want to go to a distillery. We just, we want to pop in. We want to see some, some things that everybody's talking about in the state of Kentucky. Right. And so I was about 16, I'd say. Um, and we went to Beam and it was before there were tours. It's before the Red Barn, which is no longer there. It's now the kitchen table, right? Right. Um, it was long before any of that was, was a thing. And we literally walked into what is now known as the Baker Beam home, formerly known as the T. Jeremiah home. And it was in Fred's office. And it was literally like him chatting with my parents and talking <laughs> about what he did and, and what his family did. And I'm just a 16 year old, like, oh my gosh, why are we here? What are we doing? Right. But right. it was such a kismet moment. It, I realized in like 2020, I was broadcasting from Fred's office and I had this epiphany moment of just like, wow, you know, yeah. when I was 16 years old, I was in this office and just didn't understand what was going on. And it was just, you know, such a, a, a big universe moment for me of, of, oh my, right. I yeah. didn't know, but maybe the universe did. Yeah. I, and I, I love uh, the campus there. So and, great, right? Claremont's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> back when the uh, first uh, Baker's single barrel came out and there was a big event there and Baker was going to be there to sign bottles. And it's, it's one of those things you don't know uh, what turnout's going to be like. Is it going to be lines you know, all the way to the highway. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I it was on a Saturday. I woke up early. I thought I'll just drive out there. So I get there. I, I, I watched the sunrise with uh, Booker and Dot. <laughs> okay. Love that. Saying, and uh, just hung out there uh, for, for the morning. And uh, then eventually other people did show up. <laughs> But I was able to get uh, a couple of bottles uh, signed by Baker and got to, to say hello to him and uh, just a, a sweet, sweet man. Lovely human. Yeah. Uh, he, they, the, the line had, had, after after a while, the line got very long and, and he walked in and he goes, why are all these people here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Very big they're, they're, response. They're, they're, they're here to see you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, so you you mentioned a little bit about uh, some of the the uh, Jim Beam brands that that were special to you. So elaborate on that a little bit, and and not by omission. You're not saying of I don't not. I don't like this one because so uh, they're all fantastic. But uh, what are some of the things that are that you like the most or have the most uh, meaning to you? I mean, I think it runs the gambit, right? I, we have a lot of brands underneath <clears throat> not only James B. Beam Distilling Company, but the Beam Centauri portfolio mm -hmm. as a whole, right? So there's there's definitely like gems outside, but if I'm, I'm keeping it in James B. Beam, um, Baker's was just one of those brands prior to getting into this business as, as the side of things. Um, that I think I knew if you came to my bar and you ordered a Baker's neat or on the rocks or in a Manhattan to me, that just like, you were my people, right? Mm -hmm. Like it just, it would trigger that, that moment of like, oh, you get it. Right. Because this liquid mm -hmm. is fantastic and it's not something that's super shiny and that, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about. So it's not something that you're trying to be the the cool person at the bar by ordering. Right. Right. Um, and so I think that that was always just something really special to me. And, and then getting into this business, getting to know Baker Beam, getting to understand, you know, that liquid as a whole and, and how it's mm -hmm. moved and, and gotten its own family now. And I just think that that's super beautiful. Um, and it, it is definitely great liquid. Um, with that, you know, OGD, I think is, is a, one of the, the bartender, you know, knockbacks for sure. Right. Um, something that, that definitely lived in that space now, um, still love my bakers, love my OGD. I am, a big proponent for Basil Hayden and everything in the Basil Hayden mm -hmm. family. I think that no matter where you are on your whiskey journey, Basil Hayden has something that you can enjoy. Um, and even if you don't enjoy something in the Basil Hayden family, okay, we do have a, a you know plethora of other brands. But I, True. 
I always tell people like I'm pretty far along in my whiskey journey and I, I still, you know, sip Basil Hayden, especially if I am going to be sipping for a multitude of the day or, you know, it's, it's going to be a long day, right? You can't have bookers at noon with your lunch and expect to be, well. you can, <laughs> but you're not going at midnight, right? That's not something that's going to be sustainable for the rest of the day. It makes for a really great lunch. Don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> But I think for for myself, especially right <clears throat> now, I am I am on a ride train. Um, mm. You know, I am really enjoying watching the Overholt family grow. Yep. Um, that is that's something super special and and projects that I've gotten to see and and be somewhat close to throughout the um, inception into where we are now. I in no way, shape, or form can take credit for any piece of it. I just kind of got to be a fly on the wall and watch and and see mm. how it's progressed. Um, and really to see some of the really cool things that Freddie is, has been doing, right. His little book series is so special and to be able to see how he has worked through what he wants that series to be, how it's come to life, how we talk mm. about it and, you know, talk about these class A whiskey blends in a way that educates people on what class A whiskey is mm. and how, how he is blending. Like when we did our class, right. Going through each one of those components, right. um, the year before, it was a, a new take and it was very Suntory thought process of he gave us all of the components, but it was the final product minus one. Mm -hmm. And that was such a cool experience because usually it's like, here's all the final, you know, components right. in their finality before becoming that final product. And in that, in that way with, with chapter six, with all of the different finishes, it was really showing us how he had gone through the process. Like if you taste this one just by itself, where it's missing this component, um, you know, it lacks this piece. Right. And so it was like watching that puzzle be put together in front of your yeah. eyes. And it was such a, such a cool way to look at it. So I would say for myself right now, I'm definitely super excited about seeing, um, the Overhope family grow. I'm excited to see Freddie's new, uh, realm of, of little book, seeing us starting to play an American single malt with Claremont Steep has mm -hmm. been a fascinating journey because something that I wasn't as familiar with moving into it and then learning quite a bit about the category itself <laughs> um, and the process of how we've gotten to where we are. So long windedly, I'm excited about everything in the portfolio, <laughs> but I think those are, those are some of the key ones that are, that are front yeah. of mind for me right now. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, I would echo as far as my favorites are, uh, or I, I got into whiskey relatively late in life okay. okay and um after i went through the uh, makers and coke phase that i think most everybody goes through in some shape form or fashion the uh my bourbon of choice was bookers and i Beautiful. like i like the boldness of it i like the stories behind it uh as i read and learned about booker fascinating character fascinating fellow. You know, yep on the Mount Rushmore of modern distillers. Yep. And, uh, you know, at that point I could get, it was six releases a year and it was $55 a bottle. So <clears throat> that worked really well. <laughs> yes. It doesn't necessarily work as well today, <laughs> but, uh, I have a little bourbon group that, um, uh, you know, I guess we've been going for maybe six or seven years now. And, uh, we'll have, uh, every February. So we've got coming up very sh soon. Uh, we used to, it used to be called Booker's night where I would okay. cover the, this huge table and uh, a variety of, of Booker's releases that went back, not super old, but you know, 2015, 2014, all the way to the current and, um, since I've, I've changed it to uh, Black Wax Night, so we'll include okay. Knob Creek, we'll include Bakers, even the newer Bakers, even though there's not Black Wax on it, um, but out of the sentimentality for it. And um, it's one of, it's one of, if not the most popular uh, event we do over the years. So if, if you're, if you're not doing anything Friday night, you want to <laughs> hang out with about a, a dozen dudes drinking high proof whiskey come on over we'd love to have you so. you know that doesn't sound terrible to be honest it doesn't it's, at all it's not a bad way to spend the evening <laughs> it really isn't um 
but Booker's was 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 my thing, uh, and and still is to a large degree. Um, Baker's uh, as well. Um, I was the guy that was, you know, don't tell anybody about this because yeah, the, keep it on the on the hush. <laughs> the best kept secret in whiskey, and you know, uh, recently uh, we were in Tennessee over the holidays. And I found a liquor store in a small town down there that had three bottles of Baker's small batch on the shelf. Lovely. And they're not there anymore. Um, <laughs> they belong in your collection. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there were four. I left one okay. because I thought, okay, let, you know, let's not be Good greedy. Samaritan. Yeah. Let's not be greedy. Um, but uh, Baker's is, is, is one. And then uh, old granddad, uh, the... Uh, uh, night my uh, first grandson was born uh, the uh, other grandfather the maternal grandfather and I we drank old granddad together so love that so uh, much that's always been a been a favorite uh, so it, what's underrated in in the Jim Beam lineup I mean let's see underrated I would say I mean, I'm always, like I said, I'm always fighting the fight for for Basil Hayden. I think it catches mm -hmm. a lot of flack, uh, especially in, in bourbon communities as a whole, as a, a starter whiskey or a whatever. And that, honestly, yes, it can be. I think mm -hmm. that it definitely lives in that space and allows people to get brought into the category as a whole. That being said, as I said before, like I'm pretty far along in my whiskey journey and I will definitely enjoy you know, some Basil Hayden Nieder on the rocks throughout my day. So um, I think that that's one that just, that gets <clears throat> lost in the bourbon enthusiast conversations mm -hmm. as just dismissed. Um, and I don't think that it should be. I think that it is, it is amazing liquid um, and definitely has its place in, in the hierarchy of when we talk about American whiskey. Um, it's hard because I think that what you know, I have a, a very trade mindset, right? I feel like I still think like a bartender. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about things that have been on our radar for a long time, it's it's the mentality um, that that I've heard maybe some some sentiments from other people, specifically like Bernie Lovers, right? Where he always says that you have to, sometimes you step on the goal to reach for the stars. Um, so thinking about the things that are bottom shelf for a lot of people, or they get stationed at the bottom shelf for a lot of people. So like your mm -hmm. ODDs, um, I think Overholt has sat in that space for a while, mm -hmm. um, as something that like, if you know, you know, but it wasn't super shiny and something that people necessarily gravitated to, but like bartenders know, right? Mm -hmm. Like the trade is definitely jazzed when it comes to Overholt. So like for me, seeing that line extension come out of, you know, moving to an 86 proof and four years old, moving and getting that bonded liquid, right? That's some of some really, right. really great stuff. Um, knowing that the uh, A Overholt will be launching cheese in like two weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, having a Monongahela style mash moving into that portfolio as well is super delicious and really excited for people to be able to experience that. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, I'm talking about it because I love it, and I'm talking about it mm -hmm. because I think people should be excited, and I hope that they are excited yeah. <laughs> to have it. Uh, so, because when uh, you did that tasting at Westport, yes, that was one of the components of Little Book Seven. Is that correct? Do I remember that right? So, having I don't, I'm trying to think of because we didn't taste every single component, so I'm not 100 percent sure if we tasted through that or not. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure we we tasted that like Monongahela rye. Yes, I think we did. Because I remember thinking, okay, this is fantastic. Yeah. Where, where, where is this? And and it's it's. <laughs> we weren't talking about it at that moment in time. It was right. still something that was on on the horizon. So, but this is coming out what end of February, first of it was March, March first, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, tell everybody about uh, what that what Monongahela rye means. What tell us about the the proof point, age, and price point. Definitely. So price points, I'm not super great on. I think we're going to be somewhere between like 35 and 45 when it comes to that. Um, that being said, people are, you know, up to their own. That's like the suggested MSRP. It's not sure. necessarily what they're going to have out there in the world. Um, I was going to grab a bottle. I just don't want to run away from the screen. Nope, that's fine. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll vamp. Okay, give me I'll one vamp, second. I'll, I'll vamp grab. for a second. And, and while she's doing that, I'll tell you what, 
the the underrated uh, Jim Beam products, in, in my opinion. One is Knob Creek Rye. I, I think that it is such a good rye and it kind of gets dismissed as uh, uh, a second thought when you know when you're doing tastings at, at, at Jim Beam okay you're gonna you're gonna pick a Knob Creek uh, bourbon single barrel and another Knob Creek bourbon single barrel and oh yeah we got a rye over here too <laughs> the, I think the Knob Creek rye is fantastic and okay. then, then the other uh, is uh Jim Bean Black. I uh, love Jim Bean Black. That's also relaunching very yes. soon. That is the uh, go-to drink for uh Jerry Dalton. Yes, it is. Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Famer Jerry Dalton and uh he loves it. He raves about it and so I, I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> Agreed. And Jim Bean Black is something that that we've touted. Not only is it something that Fred and Freddie sip at home, you know, a lot of folks that work within our distillery mm -hmm. definitely sip that. That is if I'm out and about and I I'm not trying to go for a, an overtly fancy cocktail it can it can hold up in a fancy cocktail but if i know that i'm walking into like a local neighborhood bar or somebody who maybe doesn't have a a strong cocktail program within that that mm -hmm. institution because it's not their what they do um jim bean black is always there for me right jim bean black black and ginger with a lime is a go-to mm -hmm. if if you are a bartender who has served me you know that that is definitely <laughs> the thing that i do um but no, yeah, I fully agree with you. But but it's going to be coming out with a, a full seven year age statement, which is really exciting. Very cool. And when is that going to happen? I will be in like the next couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs> so. so, so what you're saying is, is my bourbon budget is going to be my whiskey budget is going to be eaten up with uh, Monongahela rye and new Jim Beam Black. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. You're gonna just just budget through through the shortest month of the year for That's your, fine. your I'll, whiskey release. I'll I'll manage. I'll manage. Okay. So tell us about this. So okay. this is a Overholt, so named for Abraham Overholt. Um, yeah, if you can see me here, um, this is the beautiful amber bottle. You can see the Monongahela mash there on the bottom. So it's a Pennsylvania style type, mm. best Pennsylvania style rye. Um, there's no corn. There's no corn in this rye whatsoever. So we were talking a little bit about Knob Creek rye. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. We do love a Knob Creek rye. That falls into the Kentucky style rye mm -hmm. realm, right, where we have around 51% rye. Uh, which is what you need to have to satisfy the category of rye. And then that secondary ingredient of corn in, in Knob Creek rye is going to allow for uh, those, those flavor profiles that we definitely understand and are very prevalent in bourbon <clears throat> to come through um, and work with rye in that category, right? With then your malted barley at the end. Um, this, no corn. So you are looking at an 80-20 split. So 80% rye, 20% malted barley. Um, so it's removing those and you're getting more of those rye characteristics and those rye notes. And I always want to steer people away from saying spicy. Right. Um, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, rye is spicy. No, that's not the right verbiage. Right. And in, in my opinion, personally, and, and honestly, the opinion of most people. Right. So if you are a rye drinker, you know that it's baking spices. You know that it is um, you get some of like the florals. And the dill notes that come through, right? Those are mm -hmm. those are different notes that rye can bring to the forefront. And so we're looking at this guy; he's ninety-five proof. Um, and I I can't speak highly enough about the liquid inside of this bottle. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's some of some of the more fantastic stuff that we've been able to produce in the last little bit. Had the opportunity to be there when we were dumping barrels and bottling. Um, felt very very special to have that opportunity. Taste it directly out of the cask. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, and gave me even more of a greater appreciation for what I was tasting inside of the bottle. Yeah. Uh, well, just the little bit that I got to try. Yeah. You was, have that little yeah, sample. It's fantastic. Really, really excited about that. And, um, can't wait to see that. So, uh, will there be a cast strength version at some point in the future? All I know right now is that we're going to be releasing this 95 proof um, in the next couple of weeks. And mm -hmm. then, you know, we'll see, we'll see what people feel about it. We'll see how it's received. Um, yep. I'm, I'm going to leave that to the brand folks and, and our marketing folks on whether or not they want to go down mm -hmm. that, that sure. realm. Um, but I think that it's fantastic liquid at all of the proof points and, and super excited to, to see how people receive it. I, yeah. I'm excited to take it out in the market, talk to people about mm -hmm. it, help kind of, get people to talk about the different types and, and stylistic types of rye. I think that that's an education piece that 
we in the industry with bourbon being such a focus for so long and mm -hmm. wonderfully a focus for so long, we have a lot of folks who have really strong bourbon knowledge and that's wonderful. I love that that, that is what's happening. Um, but there's an opportunity for people to, to nerd out on rye as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's really exciting. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate that you say it. It's not rye is just not spicy. Um, that's, I mean, I've, I've done blind tastings with people that have excellent palates and you know, they're, they're not, you know, can I, I rate these from spiciness? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And definitely. guess what? The rye is never the, <laughs> never the most spicy in the lineup. And, right. And uh, I'm trying to like, look and see like, cause I know that there's some like notes on here and just, you know, it is non-chill filtered, right? I don't think we talked about that. Non-chill filtered. We're looking at, um, you know, four year age statement, but balanced notes and robust of warm spice, right? So it's not spicy, but having those warm, robust spices that right. come through. Right. So I think that's a great distinction. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, yeah I think that's great. Uh, introducing um, the, the, the Jim Beam enthusiast to, to that style of rise is fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. Looking Pushing forward. the all. I mean, you know, I feel like with James and Beam, we just continue to, to see, how we can push the envelope of American whiskey underneath the tutelage of, of Fred and Freddie, right. As our seventh and eighth generation master distillers. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's go to uh, the sample C then. Yes. I and, I've been breathing for a minute. Okay. And so Beth, as we're, we're drinking uh, on this one, uh, I want to ask you some music questions. Sure. Do you, do you remember the uh, first album you ever bought? Or were you buying CDs when you first started with music? So when I first started in music, I was buying cassette tapes mm -hmm. um, or mixing my own cassette tapes yes. with radio, right? Yes. Just, um, <laughs> yeah, that was a thing. I come from, like I said, I come from a very large family, yours, mine, and ours family. So I'm actually one of 10 children. Wow. Um, depending on how you look at it, I have all of the complexes because I am the youngest, the oldest, the middle, and the only, depending on how you want to look at it. So. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I have influence from my older siblings. Uh, my first cassette tape that I remember actually physically, I believe was a gift from a friend. Mm -hmm. um, and it was Janet Jackson's Velvet Rope. Um, okay. That was the first one. Um, I, yeah, it's, I wore that out. Um, I don't know if I was supposed to have it. So sorry, mom and dad. Um, I was a bit young, but loved it. Thought it was super amazing. Um first cd i owned is embarrassing but very on brand for somebody who was born in 1987 it was hansen <laughs> um <laughs> very on brand yeah, okay I, I was in like fifth grade um we all start somewhere we all, we start, all somewhere. start somewhere yeah it was um and then my first record i didn't actually buy records until i was a bit older and i i bought uh, I, I received a turntable as a guest as a guest, oh my gosh, as a gift, excuse right. me. I'm a guest on Bur Bourbon Turntable yes. right now. Um, <laughs> but I received it as a gift. Um, and I purchased um, a Nina Simone Greatest Hits. Okay. Was the cool. first actual record that I purchased myself. Cool. Yeah. That is very cool. And yeah, I, honestly, I was listening to Janet Jackson this week. Uh, yes. not, not velvet rope. I was listening to control and uh, rhythm nation, but Love. you know, there, there was an era there where it was, she was, she was not, you know, Michael, but she, she was a strong presence though. She had a lot of really great music going on Agreed. and, uh, should not have, should not be dismissed, uh, by any means. Do you remember your first concert? I do. My first concert was Lori Morgan. It's St. Bonaventure very cool. Arena. Say, very cool. <laughs> Which, like, I say <laughs> that to people, and they're like, one, don't know where St. Bonaventure is, and two, don't know who Lori Morgan is. Um, yeah. But I definitely, I grew up I grew up in a strong um, country music household. Yeah? Yeah. Well, that's the uh, name of the bar that your parents owned. Agreed. Yeah. And, and in there, I met, um, you know, like I said, they had... They had different guests that would come through um, and would perform at that establishment. I remember my, my stepdad passed on the chicks right before they blew up. <laughs> um, I just remember him like listening and he was like, I just don't think that that's what, you know, folks are 
are here are gonna want um and then i would say like four months later they just blew up and it was like okay Oops. well maybe that was not um <laughs> the most keen advice um but what we had an amazing opportunity like as as a small child i got to meet um some some legends in country so i i met johnny paycheck and spent time with him oh, cool. on like hanging out. I was like, I don't know, maybe nine or 10, yeah. just sitting on a bus, shooting the shit with him and then listen <laughs> to him sing, you know, take this job and shove it. Yep. <laughs> and, um, John Connolly got to meet him and, you know, rose colored glasses and, and all yeah, of that. So, wow. Yeah. Really cool opportunities. My parents have pictures somewhere. I'm sure they're terrible. I oh. I wore hats then too. They Did were just you? really terrible cowboy hats. Yeah. Okay. Well, find <laughs> if you can find those pictures, send them to me. Next time we have you <laughs> on, we'll, we'll we'll share those with the world. I'll see if I can't find. Expose <laughs> <laughs> so myself. So, um, what do you, if if um, if we're going somewhere? We're going out to. We're driving down to to to. The, Jim Beam Distillery together, and we meet up, and I'm in your car. What are we listening to while we're driving there? Depends on the day. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say that now that Spotify has those day lists, I get called out on the regular, and it's like, <laughs> have you seen how they just they form the titles of those things? It's like manic sad girl depression <laughs> and you're like really i didn't think that it was that bad today, but thank you for thinking of me like that. Um, I am a mix of songs on repeat that I've listened to m the entirety of my life. Yeah. Um, I am an amalgamation of like a small little um, toe in the water for, for emo life for a little yeah. bit. I am um, country. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I am all over the place. As yeah. of right now, I will say it has been a strong Teddy Swims world that okay. I have been living in. That's the last concert I went to. I adore that fell in his voice um you know his music definitely speaks i think on on a soul level um so i truly appreciate that and and a lot of the music that, that falls under that category since beyonce dropped uh her texas hold'em song it has been mm -hmm. stuck in my head i woke up this morning <laughs> singing it um it's so much so that i've got my howdy honey earrings yeah. that i found um which just feel very on point um, but yeah, I'm, I'm all over the place. You might, you might get a little bit of Patsy Cline. You might get a little bit of Dolly Parton. You might get a little bit of Boys to Men. The two album is one of my, my favorite albums yeah. of all time. When, when was the last time you listened to Hanson? Oh God. <laughs> um, weirdly <clears throat> enough, probably like less than a year ago when we just threw Umbop on for no yeah, reason whatsoever, no reason. except yeah. just to jazz some people in the car up. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we made it about halfway through the song and somebody was like, why? What is happening right now? <laughs> uh, music obviously uh, can either reflect mood or can uh, adjust mood. Mm -hmm. how, do you, you, how do you use music most often when it comes to that? I think I'm a little mix of both, to be honest. I, I listen... I, I just moved not that long ago um, into a home. My, my life has kind of um, restarted in so many beautiful ways. My son went to college. I'm, you know, I'm living in a, in a different world and as an empty nester than I had in the past. And mm -hmm. um, having my own space and having that, I, I didn't have a TV right away because I was like waiting to buy the TV that I wanted. And so I have speakers throughout this house and I blast music constantly. And, and I realized that I dance around a lot and I, you know, I love having music on when I cook and I love, so it's like, it's almost not only just like a mood reflection, but a mood, a mood adjuster as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I love surrounding myself with music and I love seeing it through my son's eyes yeah. and his best friend. Like they have a turntable now that they leave here instead of lugging it back and forth from college. And they are super into vinyls right now. So yeah. they're like, you know, I'll get a random text. Hey, what is this genre of music called? And he'll just like, start listing not names of people or songs which is not helpful at all but he's just <laughs> like when they do this what do you think this style of music is called <laughs> but it's been a beautiful thing to be able yeah. to share that with my kiddo no it, it is it it means a lot when um one when when your children reflect your taste in music I mean, when your children reflect your <laughs> your values in any way, it, yes. it 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 is it feels good. But I get called it, out on my music quite a bit, so I feel <laughs> we 
<laughs> we're halfway reflected and halfway made fun of, which is fine. I'm comfortable well, with that. But but uh, it's also something to see them develop some of their own That's taste it. in music. That's what I love. And um, the reasons why. Not just, well, it's what's popular. Okay. Well, oh, yeah. He's also anti popular. So, yeah. like, he, if it's popular, he's like, I don't want anything to do with it. He won't watch <laughs> movies when people are like, this is the greatest movie. And he'll watch it like four years later because he wants to wait until it's not cool. Right. Until it's not <laughs> right. <Sure>. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's, oh, teenagers. It's, it's kind of like, you know, not to you know, speak ill of another brand, but it's like Blanton's, you know, it, it, it everybody went through a Blanton's phase too. Okay. And, and if you were as fortunate as I was to go through it, when you could actually find it on the shelf and yep. uh, dig around through boxes and find the letter that you didn't have, then I, I consider myself blessed, but uh, you know, for, for the, the poor folks that are trying to accomplish that these days. Yeah. It's a difficult, uh, very, it's a difficult very, journey very now. Very sorry for you. Um, so, um, let's talk about the flight that okay. we tasted. Um, I'm not going to ask you to guess, but if you want to guess, you're more than it. welcome to. I made initial guesses off of the nose alone. And now mm -hmm. that I've sipped through them, it's going to be a question mark as to how much I remember of each. Um, mm -hmm. Did you go in proof order or no? Uh, it is in definitely in proof order. Okay. I have it in proof order in my brain. Okay. But I don't think I'm right. Okay. Well, <laughs> let me do this because there, there's an episode of Seinfeld. Do you ever watch Seinfeld? You... I have recently rewatched all of Seinfeld. Yes. Okay. So there's an episode of Seinfeld where uh, George has candy stolen while at a car dealership. Okay. And he puts out what he call what was he called it a candy lineup and so that trying to bring in the guy that he thinks stole his candy to identify yes. it and uh he comes in to try to uh you know close the, the deal on 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 uh proving that this guy stole his candy and all the employees are in there eating it all and his line is they're all twix Okay, <laughs> so these are all bakers. Okay, they're all baker single barrel. No. Oh no, old. Okay. We started with uh, the small batch. Heard. Then we went to a single barrel. Okay. And then we went to a thirteen. Heard. Okay, so. I didn't pull the the dusty, but I did pull the thirteen and Baker's single barrel. Okay, as the last two. That's pretty good. Um, the first one, and I was I I went back and forth on it because I was like, it <clears> is <throat> definitely over hundred proof, but it is top palate. So like Knob Creek usually hits me mid to back palate, mm -hmm. so I was like, it can't can't be Knob Creek, even though it does have a lot of that caramel on the nose. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of that toasted marshmallow that I typically get from a Knob Creek, but it didn't hit my palate the same way, which yeah. is super interesting, but it's been a hot minute since I've gone back and reevaluated the, the dusty yeah. of bakers. So they're all bakers. And I think that one, I would love to see the small batch come back because I, you know, I'm just. It, I was, I've always been partial to it. Uh, I have several bo bottles hidden in places around my house so that I don't <laughs> <Perfect>. find them. <laughs> uh, and, but the, I, I really enjoyed the single barrels when they first started that out. Yes. Um, you know, I, and I actually wrote an article about, uh, I think I had three of the, the Baker single barrels and I did tasting notes on that. And then I went back and did the same thing with the small batch and just kind of compare and contrast. And you can really get, if you're looking at the single barrels and the elements that you're getting at it, at of it and, and um, you can see how <laughs> those single barrels fit in to what's what you get from the small batch. 
Yeah. So so it's very interesting to do. Um, and then the Baker's thirteen is uh, phenomenal. Gosh, yeah, phenomenal liquid. It it at I tend to to not gravitate towards things that are extra aged. You know, um, if if I'm getting a Knob Creek, I'll probably pick the nine year over the fifteen. Yeah. Okay. I, I prefer the sweeter notes to the oakiness, but this thirteen, while there's some oak presence to it, it's not overpowering. It doesn't dry out your palate every time For you sure. take a sip. Yeah. It's. It, I always tell people like, if I want to make a candle out of the aromatics, I know mm -hmm. that I love it. Right. And I really feel like Baker's 13 would mm -hmm. make a wonderful aromatic candle. <laughs> like, yeah. Such beautiful notes and flavor. And also not like none of these are overbearing on your palate. Right. You're ready to take that next sip. Yes. And and the Baker's 13 has just enough of, of tannins in it that it makes you want to take that next sip. Yeah, you got that a little bit of a stringency on the yep. tail end, which, which is yeah. which is dangerous. Always. <laughs> Always dangerous. I know. I was like, do I have my Baker photo in here? I don't. I like. I'm re. I. I like. I said. I moved, and so putting my office together has been a, a beautiful journey. Um, <laughs> and I have plenty. Spending time with Baker has been one of the many perks of of this job, and getting to know him and getting to know the history of mm -hmm. not only what he has done within Beam, but like what the family was like. He Booker was his cousin, right? He got to see Fred grow up. He got to see Freddie grow up. He got to see the business when nobody gave a shit about American whiskey, right? Right. And, um, you know, see his father who was uh, was working in the business as well. And so um, really, really lucky to be able to, to spend some time with him and see some of just the things that live in his mm -hmm. repertoire of literal American history and American whiskey history that he holds on to. Yeah. Um, and I have this really great picture of him holding up uh, an old document that talked about how much everything cost. It was like payroll. It was how much the grains cost, how much, you know, the, all of these shipping things mm -hmm. were a piece of, and it's just such a cool little like frozen moment in time from I think like the fifties or sixties, yeah. which was nuts. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, but uh, just uh, again, I, I'm not claiming to know him. I, I've had the pleasure of spending maybe five or 10 minutes chatting with him once, but just such a gracious guy. He He's understanding now, I think, this love that is overflowing for American whiskey. Because, I mean, like I said, mm -hmm. he, he spent so much of his time in his career where people just, they were on clear spirits where this was your granddad's, you know, thing. And it wasn't necessarily something that people were the enthusiasts that they are today mm -hmm. over American whiskey. And so, yeah, he's it's been a really cool evolution to watch him kind of realize like, oh, people care and they care a lot. And they right. care about, you know, seeing him and Fred and Freddie. And... They, 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 I think people do care a lot. And I think sometimes it can get carried away. But I think, <laughs> you know, well, I, 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 talking about bookers and... Mm -hmm. What Jim Beam Distillery managed to do was, with a product like Booker's, was to get people to feel like they owned it as much as the distillery owned it. I think that there's just a, it's, it's just a product that, I don't know if it's just the batch numbers, I don't know if it's the names, I don't know if it's people just are drawn to, to Booker and his larger than life persona that, that still mm -hmm. lives on. But people took ownership of that brand. Mm -hmm. And I mean, yeah, we lost him 20 years ago, which is right. Insane to think about. And, and I wasn't drinking it when, when he was, when he was around, but, I was uh, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite. Like you're talking about people loving to stump. Like, you know, like, like you get in a space where they like ask you the questions and things. There was a, there was a fellow at one of the tastings that I did. And he was like, what did Booker carry in his flask in his back pocket all the time? And I could tell that he was just trying to, you know, be, right. be cool in front of his friends. And I was like, I don't know. 
And he was, I was like, do you know, like, do you want to tell me what you mm -hmm. think it was? Because it feels like you want to tell me what you think it was. Right. He's like, oh, well, yeah, you always had old tub. And I said, every time did you drink out of his flask in his back pocket every single time? And he's like, no, that was mainly what he carried. And I said, great. I was a junior in high school when he passed away. So and I just like looked this man dead in the eyes and, you know, the wives that were with him definitely because well. they were like, Haha, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> But like even at well, the beginning of this, when you were saying, like, I have no problem saying I'm wrong. I don't know everything. If I'm in a room and I am the person that knows the most, why am I in that room? Right? <laughs> I should never be in a room where I'm the person that knows the most. <laughs> yeah, but there, there, there is a a bourbon bro mentality oh, in the yeah. whiskey world that you know kind of ruins it for everybody <laughs> if you let it. Um, and I'm just sassy enough. There, there, <laughs> there, there's no place for that. I mean, um, I have lots of, uh, uh, I know lots of, of very smart, talented women that are in this industry and in different, uh, different aspects of it. And just, I mean, I'll see him talking with some, some guy and he's, mansplaining something to him like dude you just have no idea you don't even know you don't you don't know, know. <laughs> you don't know how much more they know than you ever how much hoped they've to forgotten know. that you never knew yeah and, no, amazing yeah. women in american yeah. whiskey all across the board large distilleries small distilleries up and coming distilleries you know mm -hmm. it's the the amount of women who have laid groundwork and put a path together and just been wholly themselves in in spaces and held their own against whether or not it was mansplaining or you know anything that that may be perceived as, as right. a negative type of environment um the utmost of respect for so many of these women sure. yeah and um you know for for what you do and um uh, the the role leadership role you have uh with the Jim Beam, James B. Beam Distilling Company. <laughs> JBBDCO, you know, real yeah. casual. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Now you're throwing out these acronyms. Get the me. acronyms I'll, out. I'll, I'll never, I'll never keep up with that. But <laughs> JBB, I, no, I'm not even going to Yep, no, nope, you're good. All good. <laughs> but you're, you're, you're doing a lot of, of great things uh, yeah. for the, in, for uh, your brand, uh, for the industry, because uh, if what's what's good ultimately what's good for jim beam or j b b d c <laughs> i don't know what what so whatever there. You're almost there one letter away. <laughs> whatever whatever works and makes things better for jim beam is going to make things better for, for for everybody and the the stories you hear of the camaraderie between master distillers from one distillery to the other and how they work together. Yeah. That, that's, that's amazing stuff. And I think that it, in a lot of ways that attitude still continues. It does. I mean, we, I, I think one of the things that I, I always like to reference is, you know, as, as terrible and awful as the heaven hill fire of 96 was mm -hmm. right that was detrimental to the business of Heaven Hill and it exposed what could happen right. if, you know, there is some sort of absolute tragedy, you know, how much can be lost. But it also showed the it, just expansive way that all of the distilleries are there to help one another. You know, people distilled for them, they bottled for them, they made sure that they miss as little amount of business as they possibly could after some right. sort of, you know, massive tragedy. I think that that's, that's such a testament to what this business is. The fact that, you know, Jimmy Russell has been like a second father to Fred, right? Because right. He, he and Booker went out on the road and they spent so much time together. Like the fact that that's also a very strong family mm. of folks in whiskey, right? It's a, right. a father son duo. And now with Bruce and, and Joanne being there as well, like it's just, it's such a, a lovely testament to mm -hmm. the fact that what is good for the goose is good for the gander. And yeah you know, everyone is there. I always call it sibling rivalry, right? Like <laughs> I can, I can, you know, be silly with my siblings, but like, don't you come in and try to mess with them. Right. Like, right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, I, I want to respect your time and, and I, 
honestly think we could talk like this for quite a while because <laughs> I, I think that you. I think that uh, our our thoughts and philosophies on on a lot of this uh, mesh pretty well. Uh, but I uh, I do appreciate you coming on and, and uh, drinking some drinking some bakers with me. I, I appreciate you pouring out bakers. I love this and uh, talking about uh, yourself and your career uh, so openly and telling us some really cool stuff that's coming down the road from uh J B B D C O. There you go. All I'm right. Done. Hey, uh, ne next time Nailed you come it. on that out, it'll just roll off the tongue. I didn't even tell you my most embarrassing. Um, I mean, Hanson was pretty embarrassing, but no, no. Well, well now we've, we've got to cover this then. You were most embarrassing. Why? It's not. I'm not even embarrassed by it. I okay. I grew up with a three <laughs> three CD disc changer, right? Like that right. was in my room with the speakers and everything. Like, that was the big thing that I really wanted to have. So when I had CDs, um, it was an, a never ending loop of the the same three CDs, and I still forever will be like these CDs hold a very special place in my heart. All of these things. So one of them is the Boys to Men two soundtrack. Yep. Or not soundtrack, but the Voice of Men right. 2 album, right? That is, that's hands down something that I like top to bottom, first play to last play, like all the way through. Same with Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill. Okay. Hands down. Um, still a whole vibe. Listen to that constantly. The third one is what throws people for a loop. Um, but my closest friends know that sometimes and just every now and again, when I need to fall asleep to something and when I need to just have that moment, my third CD was the Titanic soundtrack, and I will <laughs> defend that with all of my heart and soul as one of the best soundtracks that has ever been created. I have had a few friends who have like stayed in the same abode as me. Um, one of one of my closest friends, mm -hmm. and she is a testament to. I'm like, hey, so the first time that we stayed and like slept in the same room in like two separate beds, I was like so things you need to know about me. Um, <laughs> I want to fall asleep to the Titanic soundtrack. And she was like, all right, bet, let's go. <laughs> and now it's like a running joke, but it's still, I fell asleep to those three CDs for like the majority of, of my youth. And so they have a very special place. <laughs> okay. So, so here's, here's the question. Yes. What does one drink to the Titanic, Titanic soundtrack? Ooh. What I pairs think with that? I think it starts with like bubble cocktails. So like whiskey and bubbles. Okay. And then it moves into like when you hit about the like lower deck scene where they're, you know, doing the dancing or whatever. Like I know that they were probably sipping on some Irish whiskey and beer. Right. Um, I'm going to move into my my whiskey on the rocks. And then as it starts to get really serious, then we just remove the rocks and we go straight, straight for the straight pours. Yeah. Yeah, yep. I think that's the evolution. <laughs> are, are, are we are we drinking high proof stuff? Are we into the to the to the bookers, or are we? Uh... I mean, towards the end, I feel like we should, yeah. right? Because isn't there the story of of the chef but... on the Titanic <clears throat> who, like, just decided that he was going to ride it down as it was sinking, and all he did was just imbibe on the multitude <laughs> of booze that were on that boat. Yeah, and um, the rumor is that he rode the entire ship down and never even got his hair wet. <laughs> And he, he survived. Like, he lived because he may what? have imbibed enough yeah. that um, the freezing temperatures of the water didn't help him. <laughs> well, some people use that to, to that was their, that was their uh, prescription to surviving COVID was high proof whiskey. So, <laughs> listen, when I unfortunately had COVID and I, like, it's a weird experience when you can't taste anything, but you're sipping mm -hmm. on bourbon, mm -hmm. made your throat feel better. <laughs> Couldn't taste it. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Definitely made it better. But you could feel it. So that's you, that's a good thing too. The Kentucky hug always pulls through. <laughs> All right. Uh, Beth, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Hope we can do it again uh sometime uh in the not too distant future. And uh any any things you've got going on, events that you've got going on that you want to uh promote? I mean, I'll be traveling um over the next little bit, definitely talking a lot about obviously a overhaul with it, it launching, talking quite a bit about um Jim Beam Black in in spaces as we're mm -hmm. we're reintroducing it with a, that seven year age statement. Um we've got some really cool stuff from Knob Creek coming out. I don't have anything necessarily to like properly plug and say, see me here at this mm -hmm. point in time. Um we we're really solidifying schedules right now across the US, but I know I'm spending 
quite a bit of time. If you are in Kentucky, if you're in Ohio, if it, you're in Pennsylvania, I'll be seeing quite a bit of you over the next awesome. little bit. I've got a trip to Georgia. I'll be at Georgia Food and Wine. Um, so if folks are down there, they'll they'll have an opportunity to listen to me talk about whiskey and and maybe sit with some some chefs and talk about some pairings. Awesome. That's yeah. good stuff. That's good stuff. And we'll, as we see uh, events come out and uh, new releases uh, from Jim Beam, of course, we'll we'll promote that on our uh, social media as well. So, well, so, we will find each other and share a dram. Absolutely. And uh, tell everybody where they can find you. So, easiest place to find me is on Instagram. So, Beth Bros. And I, I have the handle Bourbon Bella on Instagram. So, Please feel free to to be a friend. All right, I I, I said that, that we we're closing this out, but I have do have one more question. Okay, Bourbon Bella. Yes. Where does the Bella come from? I honestly don't remember exactly what I was thinking when I I had like a personal Instagram handle, and then when I started mm -hmm. in the whiskey business, it was it was right at like the close of. 2012 beginning of 2013 as we were launching mm -hmm. um and, and opening our business um and i just remember being like well you know i want to be i want to be the the bell of bourbon and there was already a bell of bourbon mm -hmm. um there were a few of those and i was like okay well i don't want to take that obviously you know let right. them live in that space but definitely inspired by that and just I decided to try Bourbon Bella and it yep. went through and it there you go. didn't have any, you know, anything already in existence. And so I just kind of ran with it. And then it became like I, I get called Bella out in in the world. Like yep. I, I've started responding to that. So, um, yeah, I think that's it was just a, a silly thing that I tried and it worked. And here we are so many years later. Jeez. There we are. Bourbon Bella. 11 uh, years later. Yeah. yeah. So follow Bourbon Bella. And. <laughs> You can follow our show. Check us out on YouTube uh, where you can watch this show. You can listen to it uh, on your favorite podcast platform. We will definitely post it on our Facebook page and we'll talk about it on our Facebook group. But as for Bella <laughs> and myself, uh, we want to thank you for watching, listening, whatever you did. Uh, but we really appreciate you coming on, Beth. And so on behalf of Beth and myself, until next time. Cheers, love, and free bird. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you. Good night.